Well, good morning. Welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you so much for being here with us in the room today. So many of you coming back, getting ready for school to start. That's so good. And also thank you for joining us online and being a part of our Avalon family online as well. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Well, this week, um, we in our staff meeting, the staff talked to me about preaching a couple of announcements. Now, you say, what does that mean? Well, it just means I make it kind of part of my sermon. I talk about it beforehand. But I grew up in a church. Uh, after my dad got saved and our family started going to church, we were all in kind of people. And I grew up in this country church in North Carolina. And it was a very unusual place. And they would have um, unusual kind of uh, preaching at times. How many ever have heard, you know what I'm talking about. Now, some of you won't, and that's okay. Some of you won't know, you won't have a clue what I'm talking about, actually. But how many have ever heard what I call a hacking preacher? You know what I'm talking about, a hacking preacher. For those of you who don't know what that is, let me demonstrate that for you. You don't have a lot to say, but you say it like this. And glory to God, hallelujah, and praise the Lord. And you just kind of hack a little bit, all right? So necessarily you're not saying anything, but you're saying it well, all right? So uh, now the church that I grew up in had some of that kind of preaching, okay? And the, the thing is that not only was the preaching a little unusual, but also the response was a little bit unusual. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a church like this, but we had a church that they kind of talked back to the preacher, all right? Now, I'm not talking about the normal amen. I'm talking about they would talk back. We had a guy in our church. His name was Troy Johnson. Troy Johnson was a drill instructor in the Marines during World War II. Now, he grew up in North Carolina, grew up on a farm, and uh, he would say some of the most unusual things back to the preacher. Uh, he would say uh, things uh, like this. Hold my mule while I shout. I don't have any idea what that meant, all right? I think he grew up on a farm plowing with a mule, okay? And if you know anything about mules, if you let go of them, they will head right back to the barn, all right? Now, you probably have no reason to know that. But um, so Troy, when he was uh, responding back to the preacher, I guess that was his way of saying amen. He would say, hold my mule while I shout. Now, I'm not going to ask you to say that, all right, so because uh, that would be a little weird. Uh, but he did say something else that I thought was kind of funny. Uh, he would say whenever the preacher made a, a good point, he'd say, fish in that hole for a while. <laughs> I, once again, I have no idea what that meant, all right? But as a kid, I thought it was awesome, all right? Because I had, you never knew what to expect when you went to church. We had one guy that came and uh, he, guess, didn't know what you're supposed to say in church either. He didn't know amen or hallelujah or any of that stuff. So he just stood up and said, hot dog, right in the middle of the message. I'm like, well, I guess that's one thing to say. But my favorite thing that Troy would say, um, and I'm going to get you to say this today. He would say, during a particularly good point, he would say, let your bucket down. Now, I think what that meant was that, you know, maybe he grew up uh, getting well water out of a well, and you'd have to let your bucket down to get the water, which represented a blessing, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it, all right? Uh, but he would say, let your bucket down. So, what we're going to do, we're going to practice that, all right? So, on the count of three, you're going to say, let your bucket down, all right? Because that lets me know that you're into the message. Uh, even though I haven't gotten to preaching yet, all right, uh, you're going to let me know that you're supporting what's being said, okay? One, two, three. That's good. That's good. But you got to do it with a little more flair. You got to, yes, fish in that hole for a while. Uh, look, you got to say, let your bucket down. You got to kind of sing song it a little bit if you're going to be like Troy Johnson was, all right? Ready? Uh, let your bucket down. All right, all right, hold on. You're getting anxious, all right? Getting ahead of yourself. So on three, one, two, three, let your bucket down. All right, give yourself a hand. You did good there today. 
Well, I said all that to say this. I've got two announcements that I'm going to preach, okay? So, uh, and not really, but I just want to let you know what's going on. Uh, two things. Number one, on September the 12th, we are going to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Avalon Church. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. I have been texting a lot of people that I know. Some used to go here. Some moved out of state. Um, I've already texted and called about 100 people, and uh, about 75 of them said they're going to be here. And I'm very excited about that, seeing a lot of them we haven't seen in a long time. And you probably know people that maybe they used to come here and they don't. Maybe they've stopped going to church. You get on the phone. You invite them on September the 12th. Now, our actual anniversary is September the 9th. But that's on a Thursday, and I don't think you want to come here on a Thursday, so we're going to celebrate it on that Sunday. All right, so you remember that. And then this next thing, I want to, I really want to challenge our church. And and I want to challenge you in something maybe that's a little unusual. Here's what I do know, that big accomplishments take big efforts. If you're going to go to another level in your relationship with God in your worship, in what God does in your life, you've got to go to another level in commitment. I've been studying the last chapter of the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the first two chapters of Acts. I'm going to be preaching on that later this year. I'll be talking about 50 days of hope that Jesus brought to the world. And one of the interesting things about that is that Jesus told them after he had resurrected, and he was here for 40 days before he ascended back to heaven, He told the disciples to wait, to wait. And they waited and prayed for 10 days, and the Holy Spirit fell. And and what I want to challenge our church to do is a 10 days of fasting and prayer. Now, when I say fasting, I don't mean that you have to go without food totally. You can do that. I plan on doing that some of the uh, days myself. But we're going to call you to a Daniel fast. If you don't know what that is, let me explain it to you. It comes from the book of Daniel. And Daniel, God's prophet, he's the same guy that got thrown into the lion's den. Um, He went on a Daniel fast. Let me explain to you what that is. He went uh, without meat. Let your bucket down. All right, so now, just kidding. I know that's old me. That's not amen, right? Without meat without bread, without sweets, and without alcohol. And so, uh, basically, you eat fruits and vegetables. And we're going to do that for 10 days. And I'm going to really ask everybody to be a part of this. Um, Our theme is going to be awakening. What we're praying for is for God to awaken you individually, to take you to another level. By the way, when you go to these levels in your life, it is such a blessing. It is amazing what God does in your life. Uh, Before we ever started this church, I went on 40 days of prayer and fasting. And God just radically changed my life forever. I was closer to God than I'd ever felt in my life. And so during this 10 days, we're going to ask you to do a Daniel fast. But what I'm also going to do is ask you to pray. Now, here's the thing. If you're not praying while you're fasting, all you're doing is going on a diet. Okay? Okay. And so prayer and fasting, Jesus said that this is a special thing that really brings God's power in our life. And so I want to challenge you. We're going to open the church for 10 straight days. I'll be here every morning at 6 o'clock. And from 6 to 7, if you want to drop in, you don't have to stay the entire time. If you want to drop in on your way to work, uh, we're going to do that. And then every day at noon, from noon to one, we're also going to have the auditorium open for prayer. And then every evening from six to seven. Now, I want to challenge you to come to this. Now, you may not be able to come to everyone, and I understand that. But you need to come to some. You say, well, I don't normally do that. Make an exception. And here's what I know. Extraordinary things that happen in your life require extraordinary efforts. And what we want is for God to do something extraordinary in your life. And so this is, this is really, I'm very serious about this. I want to challenge you to do this. Um, it, you can fast, obviously. You can pray. You don't have to be at the church to pray. But I want to challenge you. And I want to really encourage you to do this. I think it will be a blessing. 
And here's what I know of the times in my life that I've fasted and prayed, especially for beyond a day. Uh, God has done something extraordinary in my life. And I want him to do that for you. And I want him to do that for us. And I believe that God will if we will pray. Once again, the disciples, there were 120 of them, not just the 12 or the 11 after Judas hanged himself. But they waited and prayed for 10 days. 10 days. And God did something extraordinary in their life. And I want to challenge you on that. Our theme will be awakening. I've got some devotionals that I've written for every day, and uh, I hope you'll be a part of it. I believe God will bless us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let your bucket down, right? All right, so uh, there's where we're going. All right, today I want to wrap up our series uh, that we've been talking about, Get Real. We're talking about a real faith. I want to ask this question to you today. Will you be ready when Jesus comes again? Will you be ready when Jesus comes again? Now, after I began to go to church with my family as a, as a young boy, I remember preachers would ask that question or would preach messages about that, that Jesus is coming again and that we must be ready. And I must tell you that that had a profound effect on my life. I will recall as a young boy, even as a teenager at times, where uh, in my prayer, even as a kid, that God did extraordinary work in my heart because I contemplated that question, will I be ready when Jesus comes? Now, I have to be honest, and this is kind of funny, uh, but, you know, the preachers would preach, Jesus could come at any time, and I would be like, God, please don't come until I get married. All right, so I wanted to, in case you're wondering, I wanted to have sex. All right, that was the real reason. And uh, that was the real reason I was asking Jesus to wait, all right? So now, I'm sure that was not a very spiritual thing, uh, but nevertheless, that's what I prayed, all right? So that's not, not what we're asking you to pray during the uh, 10 days of uh, prayer and fasting, but nevertheless, I would think about this, and I would pray about this, and it's a very serious question. Will you be ready when Jesus comes Again, it's hard to be ready for some things because we don't know what to expect. For example, it's hard to be ready for the responsibilities of adulthood. Our youngest daughter, her name is Brooke, and she says this to me sometimes, adulting is hard. And I'd never heard that before, but adulting is hard sometimes. And uh, you don't know what to expect. Uh, as, a, as a teenager, I was looking forward to the freedoms and the privileges of adulthood. And I got tired of uh, people telling me what time to be home and how to spend my money and where I could go and what to wear. And I had no idea that once I got married that that would continue to be told to me what to do and what to wear and what time to be home. So some things you don't get out from under as an adult. But I was unaware of some of the responsibilities of adulthood. And I remember planning my first budget. Now, I'm not mocking uh, those of you that are young and you haven't had to plan your first budget yet. But as you get my age and you look back when you did your first budget, you kind of laugh. Because I had no idea how expensive living really is. And I thought to myself, two people can live as cheaply as one. And that might be true, but only for half as long, all right? Because you're not going to make it if you think that uh, it only takes just a little bit. But I wasn't really prepared for that. I, was, I didn't know what to expect. And I do know this, that even though there are some things in life that you may not be ready for, you may not be prepared for, you can be prepared for eternity. You can be prepared for Jesus to come again. So I'm going to read to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll begin in verse number 50. The Apostle Paul writes this. He said, I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. 
And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And if you're wondering what he's talking about here, he's talking about when Jesus conquered death when he got up out of the grave. Death is swallowed up in victory, the victory of Jesus Christ. And then he says, oh, death. Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And I'm glad to tell you that Jesus took the sting out of death, and he got the victory over it. And you can be ready either when you die and face God or when Jesus comes again before you die. It says, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today, won't be very long, on how to be ready when Jesus comes. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help all of us to be ready. I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in our midst today for those that need to take that first step of being ready, of being saved. I pray that today would be their day. For those joining us online that have been wandering in their life and they they maybe have drifted, God, may this be the day that they get ready. God, I pray that you'd let us see a fresh vision of your grace, a fresh vision of your love. And Lord, help us to be ready when you come again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, today's message is going to be really, really simple. And I find that sometimes simple is the best. And so I want to just give you four ways that you can be ready for Jesus to come. And here's the first way. You can be ready for Jesus to come by getting saved, by being saved saved. Notice what he said in the first verses that we read. He said, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. He was just simply saying, you can't get saved through the power of your flesh. You don't do it by being a good person. You don't do it by keeping the Ten Commandments. You don't do it by going to church. Now, those are Those are good things, okay? Going to church, keeping God's law, those are important things. We should obey God. But listen, we do not go to heaven when we die. We do not get ready to meet Jesus simply by being religious. Did you know that there are many people in the world that are religious but lost? And if you want to know the confidence that you're ready, and please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. When I say be ready when Jesus comes, I'm not suggesting that we should not have great awe and respect for God and for when he comes. We should. I mean, I don't know about you, but thinking about standing before the God of the universe, the one that is the personification of holiness and love and righteousness and has never done anything wrong. He's never made a mistake. He's never forgotten anything except for willfully forgetting my sin. I don't know about you, but that's a little intimidating to me. Now, I know it's going to be a glorious and a great day, and I can't wait to see Jesus, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a little bit scary, to be honest. We don't have to be afraid because of the grace of God. And I want you to understand, you can be ready by being saved. You say, what does that mean? Well, that you come to a point in your life when you're being drawn to God. You see, most people don't realize this, but when you're not a Christian yet, when you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, God will speak to you. Now, I don't mean that he necessarily is going to speak to you in an audible voice. He does that sometimes and to some people, but for most of us, it would scare us out of our skin if God spoke to us audibly. But God speaks to every person in their mind and in their spirit. And I can remember the very first time that I ever felt that God was speaking to me. I did not know what it was. 
I was just a little boy. I told you before, I got saved as an eight-year-old boy. The very first time my dad had not been saved very long, the very first time that I felt God drawing me and speaking to me, I was a six-year-old boy. And my parents were taking me to church. And I remember hearing the preacher preach. And I had this sudden sense that I was being drawn toward God. That I was, uh, I didn't know what it was. I just knew that something was happening in my spirit. And I remember as a little boy walking down the aisle at the little Baptist church. And I began to cry. I didn't know why. I didn't know what in the world was going on. And unfortunately, nobody shared the gospel with me at that point. I remember a woman came forward and she put her arms around me. She patted her, uh, patted me on the shoulder. She said, oh, son, it's okay. And she prayed. And I went back to my seat and I was like, well, that was weird. I don't know what that was. As an adult, I realized that was the first time in my life. Just like God spoke to Samuel as a young boy in the Old Testament, God was speaking to me. I didn't know it at the time, but I was being drawn by the Holy Spirit. And by the way, whenever you go to church and you feel that sense of, I call it the white knuckling it, you grab the seat in front of you and you white knuckle it because you're not sure what's going on, but you know that you've got to hold on because you're not sure what's happening. Or maybe you feel that you're being drawn and you have questions, you don't know the answers to them. That's God speaking to you. And I've told you before about people that have come here and they come Sunday after Sunday and they're like, I don't know what's going on in this place, but I just keep finding myself being drawn back here. Well, that's nothing spectacular about our church. That's God speaking to you. And when you get saved, God draws you. Jesus said that My spirit will not always strive with a man, meaning that he will strive at some point with us. In other words, he will draw us. And so being saved means that you receive Christ as your Savior. You acknowledge to God that you're a sinner, that you cannot go to heaven on your own by your good works. It doesn't work that way, but because of the love of God and the grace of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, he paid for your sin. He paid your penalty that you and I should have suffered ourselves, and he made a way for you to be made right with God. And that's what we mean when we say get saved. Uh, We're not talking about You have to have some weird experience. You know that different people have different experiences when it comes to being saved. I've seen some people that they weren't very emotional at all. They gave their life to Christ and God radically changed their life. But they didn't shed a tear. They didn't laugh. They didn't even act like they enjoyed what they were doing. But that was just kind of their personality. And there are some, they get all happy. And boy, they want to run around and rejoice and let everybody know. And then there are others that cry. And it's okay. The fact is, if you want to be ready when Jesus comes, you got to be saved. Here's the second thing, very simple. Live as if Jesus could come today. Now, I don't know when Jesus is going to come. And anybody that tries to tell you they do know, they're not telling you the truth because Jesus himself said, no one knows the day or the hour. Okay? You don't know. Now, do I believe Jesus could come in my lifetime? Absolutely, I believe he could. Uh, Do I know if he will? I absolutely do not know that. But what I do know is this. I need to live every day of my life as if he could come today. Now, what does that mean? Well, once again, we're not talking about perfection. And we're not talking about getting a guilt trip. But we're talking about Uh, The fact that you and I must be ready by living in a right relationship with God doesn't mean you're perfect, but rather it means that you are living in relationship with the Lord. He said there, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, not everyone's going to die before Jesus comes, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed for this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality now there are differing viewpoints on end times that uh, I'm going to give you a theology word that I paid tens of thousands of dollars to learn and uh, if I don't share these occasionally uh, then I will have wasted all that money all right so Uh, But the word eschatology, eschatology, 
Let your bucket down. All right, you got a blessing out of that word, right? Um, that just simply means the study of last things. And there are so many different viewpoints on the rapture and the second coming of Christ and the millennial reign. In fact, there are differing views on our staff. But let me just tell you, what's important is not whether you believe uh, the film Left Behind or not, or you read those books or any other kind of uh, eschatology. What matters is that you believe that Jesus is coming again. That's what matters. And live as if Jesus could come today. Now, I don't know when it's going to be, but you and I need to be ready. We need to live like it could be today. Here's the third thing I want you to see. You need to learn to live for the eternal rather than the temporary. He wrote, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, if you didn't get any sentence in the Bible but that, it'd be enough. God will give you victory through Jesus. And that's good news. And it's not our strength. It's not our power. It's not our goodness. It's not our effort. But it's through Jesus Christ that God gives us the victory. And so you and I must live as if we're living for the eternal rather than the temporary. Do you know that is the definition, the biblical definition of worldliness is thinking like the world thinks? I I grew up uh, in a church that, you know, they were very interesting and they had weird things that they considered worldly. Going to the skating rink was considered worldly. I have absolutely no idea why. I think it was because they played the devil's music down there, that's what they used to call it. Uh, the devil's music and of course as a teenager when they would say that I couldn't listen to that that was the very thing that I wanted to listen to Uh, maybe you were like that as well but I know that you and I if we're worldly the definition biblically is thinking like the world thinks in other words thinking that this is all there is you know what's worldly is getting up and going to work and having a house and taking a vacation every year and helping put your kids through college and planning for retirement and never, ever thinking about eternity. That's the definition of worldliness. Jesus kind of fleshed that out for us. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He said, for in that day, there was eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Man, what terrible sins those are. Wait a minute. What's wrong with eating and drinking? Well, you've got to do that to stay alive. There's no sin in doing that. Now, you can eat too much. You can drink too much. Yeah. Is there anything wrong with marrying or giving your children away in marriage? No, that's a beautiful thing. That's a God-ordained thing. So what was the problem? What was God saying? He was just simply saying that they went about their life as if. There was no God. Oh, there are people that are what I would call Christian atheists. They believe in God. They just don't live like he exists. They just don't live like there's an hereafter. They don't live like there's an eternity. They live as if this is all there is. And friend, if you live just for today, if you live just for a bigger bank account, I hope you get a bigger bank account. That'd be awesome, okay? But that's not what life is about. I hope that you get a nice house and a nice car and and a boat and whatever else that you want, that you earn it, that you work hard, that you put God first, that you honor him with your money. But that's not all there is. And what you and I need to understand is this. That if we're going to live the way Jesus wants us to live, we've got to act as if eternity is a lot longer than this life. Because I've got to be honest with you, it is. I mean, if my life, let's say I live to be a really old man and I live to be 100 years old. Now, I don't know if I want to live that long, to be honest. And I'm just being honest about that. I want to live as long 
as going to Golden Corral is not the highlight of my week. That's how long I want to live. I want to be able to get around. I want to be able to do stuff. And I want my mind to, you know, not have just a single marble rolling around up there. I want to be able to live exactly that long. If that's till next week, then fine. All right. But I know this, that if I live to be 100 years old, that is a drop in the ocean compared to eternity. Now, here's the, here's the question. Does it make sense to live only for this life when it's just a very short part of your life? Or should we live for eternity? Should we act like that we want to take our loved ones, our family with us to eternity? Well, we need to live for eternity. Then here's the last thought. I'm done. If you want to live as if Jesus could come today, you want to be ready for that. Focus on the basics rather than the spectacular. Now, what do I mean by that? There are a lot of Christians, they think that success comes from the dramatic. That even the Christian life, it's got to be, you know, I walk in and, you know, the, uh, the Red Sea parts and uh, manna rains down from heaven when I walk into church and every day of my life I wake up at 4 a.m. to the sound of angels' wings slapping and all through my day there's an angel playing a harp behind me, playing worship music and everywhere I go I have nothing but kind words to say and I'm talking like this and I don't know why I'm talking like this. I don't know if that has anything to do with Christianity but here's the point. There are a lot of people that think that in order to be a good Christian, it's got to be dramatic. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some dramatic things. But if you're going to be good at living the Christian life, you got to do what it takes to be successful in anything. Did you know this? That experts teach us that it takes 10,000 hours of practice before you're really ever good at anything. If you want to be an artist, it's going to take about 10,000 hours to get good. If you want to be a basketball player, it's going to be, take about 10,000 hours of practice plus some talent to be good. If you're going to be a good musician, it's going to take about 10,000 hours of practice before you ever become good. And in the same way, if you're going to live the Christian life, you got to do the basics well. Don't fall for this idea of social media Christianity. It matters not how many likes you have, how many followers you have on social media. God doesn't give a flip about that. But you know what he does care about? That you get up every day, and even though it may seem boring at times, that you start your day by acknowledging him. You spend a little bit of time talking to him during the day. You spend a little bit of time during that day reading the Bible or getting the app and letting it read to you on the way to work or whatever, that you spend a little bit of time thinking about how you can love your neighbor as yourself, that you spend a little bit of time during your week thinking about how you can invite somebody to come meet this Jesus that has changed your life. It's not being wakened at the uh, foot of your bed with a 900-foot Jesus uh, that makes the dramatic or, or that makes your life a better Christian life. You know what is important for you to do as a Christian? It's the basics. Go to church, be in a small group, serve in a ministry, read your Bible, pray, invite somebody to church with you so they can hear about Jesus. You see, it's the basics. It's the basics. Treat your wife the way God wants you to. Guard your tongue. It's the basics. It's the basics. And what you and I need to understand is that God shows us how to do this. He says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You know what he's saying there? Be faithful. That's what steadfast means. It means be faithful. Stay planted. Be immovable. Some people are moved so easily. They quit so quickly. Be immovable. Plant some roots. Yes, God wants to let your branches reach to the sky, but in order for your branches to reach to the sky, you've got to have some roots that go down to the water. 
And until you get that, your tree is going to fall over. Any little wind is going to blow it over. And God says, stay planted. Be immovable. And then be willing to go above and beyond. The word abounding gives the idea of extravagance, excess, and this is really my favorite part of the definition, overflow. Here's my question for you. Are you living out of the overflow? Is your Christian life marked by the undertow? That undertow that will drag you down or drag others down with it? Or is it marked by the overflow of a life of joy that comes not from being perfect? And I'm not suggesting you have to go to church seven days a week or that you have to sit around and uh, listen to worship music uh, 24 hours a day. No. You know what get, brings glory to God? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all of the glory of God. You can bring glory to God by going to work. You can bring glory to God on vacation. You can bring glory to God by having a meal with your family. You can bring glory to God by the simple things, the basic things, as long as... You've got God first in your life. So how do you get ready for Jesus to come again? Well, you don't quit. You stay in the game. Galatians 6, 9, so let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Aren't you glad that God is never late? He's always on time. At just the right time, God's going to bless you. At just the right time, he's going to give you the guidance that you need. At just the right time, he's going to be real to you. At just the right time. You say, well, I haven't seen that recently, and it seems like I've gotten a little bit stale. Don't give up. Stay with it. Stay faithful. Be immovable. And God says, when you do that, know that your labor in the Lord will never be in vain. Heavenly Father, help us to live as if Jesus could come today. We know he could. We don't know if he will. But Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to live our life for you. God, help us to get back to the basics. So many Christians think that the dramatic has to happen. God, help us to realize that it's the daily things. It's those simple choices that will help us take our next step. And after that series of next steps, we find ourselves in a destination where you want us to be. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder if today would be the day that you'd like to receive Jesus. Got to receive Jesus if you're going to be ready for him to come again. Maybe you would pray something like this, and you can do this online or in the room. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. And I believe that you will forgive me my sins and make me right with the Heavenly Father. And I'm asking you to do that right now. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, understand we're not saying that a The prayer has magical little words, but the Bible does say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I wonder today, if online you would say, Pastor, I pray to receive Jesus. Please listen closely. Hit that button that says that you trusted Christ today, that you got saved today. Let us know that. I wonder if there's anyone in the room today, nobody looking but me, you'd say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you today to receive Jesus, and I want you to know about it. Would you raise your hand just high enough and long enough for me to see it? I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Several people. Thank God. Praise God. Let your bucket down. It's okay. You can clap. Some of you are like, he was in the middle of praying. Is it okay to clap? Yeah, it's okay. I wonder if you'd say today, Pastor, I want you to pray with me that God helps me be ready. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. And I know you're not talking about perfection. I'm not, that's not what I'm striving. But I want to be ready when Jesus comes again. Would you just lift your hand as a testimony to God? 
God bless you. God bless you. Heavenly Father, help us to be ready. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, let me just give you a couple of final instructions. If you're new to Avalon, please take a moment and fill out the Next Step card. Uh, If you've never filled out one of these, please do it. It'll help us get you connected, and uh, it'll be a real blessing. We promise not to bug you. Uh, We're not going to stop by your house unannounced or anything like that, but we would like to pray with you. And so please fill that out for us. If um, you pray to receive Christ today, please take that Next Step card, put your name on there, and check that. It says, I pray to receive Christ today. All right, pretty simple. And uh, we'll follow up with you on that. Or maybe you're interested in getting baptized. Check that. Or you'd like to go to the next step class, which is coming up on the 29th as well. So uh, you maybe would go to that. If you have a prayer request that you'd like to give to us, you can put this on this card and um, we'll follow up with you as well. I would say this. um, One of the burdens that God has put on my heart recently is about our church serving and not just sitting. We will be going back to two services sometime later this year, Lord willing. Um, Our attendance is more and more people are coming back from COVID-19, and we're thankful for that. And um, we've got room to put a whole lot of people in this room at one time. But the reason we will go to two services once we get a few more people coming is very simple. We want to give you an opportunity to serve in a service and to worship in a service. Um, This makes a huge difference, especially in our children's ministry. And so... um, I, one of the burdens that God has put on my heart for our church is that we serve. We're going to create opportunities for you to step on, to get on ramped easy. Um, we don't want you to stay there. We want you to take your next step in that as well. But we really want to challenge you to serve. Do something. Do something that you can use your ability, uh, your talent here at this church. And I know God will bless you for it. And uh, you'll be very, very happy that you did. I promise you that. So, all right. Let's everyone stand together. Thank you for being here with us today at Avalon Church. Thank you for joining us online at Avalon uh, Online today. And uh, all I've got to say is this one last thing before you leave. Let your bucket down. God bless you. Have a great week. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.